I'm pretty sure you can tell, but I'm not James. Uh, I think it wasn't changed in the schedule yet, but uh, I'm actually taking over the functional testing framework talk from James. Uh, he already has given several great talks. To it's updated. Uh, okay. Yeah, but, but I, I took over this talk, uh, pretty short notice from James. Um, yeah, and uh, like yesterday, um, I like to give really hands-on talks, and uh, I also know it's uh, actually lunchtime, so um, I will make it pretty quick. I'm pretty sure I don't need the half hour that is scheduled. So this is a very, very brief introduction, basically, into the, into the functional testing framework. I will explain what the functional testing framework actually is. Um, and then what, what's in a test that uses the functional testing framework. Uh, we'll look at, short, at a short example and um, then I give just some additional hints. So where are we actually in Bitcoin Core right now? Um, what are actually functional tests? So a functional test in general is defined as a test that um, tests functionalities or features of software from a user's perspective. Um, that means that you're actually testing the full stack um, and in Bitcoin, it's a bit hard to define or like I think you have to extend the definition a little bit from, from other Bitcoin or from other software projects um, because you also have to think of the whole network. And, uh, but another way of thinking about it is that um, nodes that you interact with in the network are also then again users who are just using their own nodes. So um, yeah, you have to, you have to just look at features from your own perspective, but also from, from the network's perspective, which then in turn also uses. Um, so it tests the full stack, and um, one other thing that results out of that is usually these tests are pretty slow. And um, so, yeah, if you run the functional testing framework or the, the full functional testing suit, you'll see it takes pretty long. In general, they take longer than, than unit tests. Um, so that's why uh, at least you should pay some attention to how you write the test and how many you write. Um, oftentimes I see people just deferring to, to writing a functional tests because they are a Python test and it's oftentimes easier to write for some people. Um, but yeah, um, just, just a hint to, to keep that in mind. So um, this is a bit hard to say in general. When do you add or edit functional tests? Um, usually when you just want to test full features, features that take multiple layers of the stack. Um, this can be almost anything in Bitcoin. Um, briefly said, the only thing where I would say it's, it's really not something where you would uh, edit a functional test or add a functional test if you, if you implement something new is or actually is when you don't really add something new is when you do a refactoring and you don't really change any, any functionality that the user sees or that the user would notice. So where are we at? Um, this is a common theme for me. Uh, I talked about this also yesterday in my debugging talk. Uh, you have to be aware where you actually are. Um, if you do any um, uh, um, like search for files, for test files, uh, it's probably going to happen to you that you're actually going to encounter a unit testing file instead of the functional testing file. You always have to watch the path that you're in the test folder and not in the test folder that is under the source directory. Um, and there you'll um, file, find files that are, um, that are following the following uh, naming scheme. Um, you first have an area uh, prefix and then you have the actual name of the test. Um, the areas are um, mempool, mining, P2P, RPC, wallet. I think these uh, basically speak for themselves. Um, there's also a single test that has the prefix tool, uh, which is uh, testing the wallet tool functionality, which is a, a different executable from, from Bitcoin D. Um, there are the interface tools, which test the REST interface and the ZMQ interface. And then there's also the feature prefix, which basically just um, tests other full features that you cannot really stick into a category with like wallet mining or mempool or, and so on. Uh, how are you running the test? Um, first of all, you can just run these tests um, directly like any other Python file, but just specifying the path. Um, this is also very helpful because you actually see all the um, self.log.info um, outputs in, in, in standard out then. 
Um, but you can also run the test through test harness and that is very helpful if you want to run all of the tests at, in one time, so the full uh, function test suit, or if you want to do some, some uh, pattern matching on, on the names, like you want to run all the, all the wallet tests, like you can see that here, um, that is helpful for that as well, but you will just not see those, those outputs that you, that you might need. Um, and then there you can also um, provide several uh, options that, are, that might be helpful for you. So um, the one that I find myself using frequently is uh, trace RPC, which is then showing you in standard out all of the um, RPC inputs and outputs. And uh, no cleanup is another one that uh, can be quite useful. Um, that means it's just not um, cleaning up all the log files, but there are also other ways to get to log files, which I'll show you later. So what's actually in the framework? Um, the framework is what you can find under the test framework folder in the test folder. Um, and this is a collection of files that have helpful functionalities that help you to use your tests, everything that you um, might want to reuse, what typically a software framework does, right? So I'm just um, listing the, or a selection of, of files that you can find in there. there are uh, I, I think uh, I think double as many files, but the other ones I think are are not so important, at least for you if you're starting out right now. Um, so uh, first, there's the the util, which has like asserts and other helpful functions that you cannot really stick into a different category. Then there's the test framework file. This is the the most important file that you're going to use in every test because this implements the Bitcoin test framework class and every test is a subclass of the Bit, uh, Bitcoin test framework class. Um, you have key.py, which um, it has helped us for ECC math, uh, script.py that has helped us for generating transaction scripts, uh, block tools help you to create blocks and transactions, and uh, Mininode um, helps you with introspections and, and help us for peer-to-peer um, -peer connectivity. So what's in a test? Um, we will look at an example in a moment. I'm just going to go over some things that you will just see in general and that is very helpful to follow. Um, in general, you will often see documentation and logs in the test. You should see that every time, actually. Um, so you'll see doc strings in the beginning of every class and every um, important function. Um, you will also see comments and you will also see the, these uh, log info outputs. And um, I think it's very important that you, that you write these not just for others, but also for yourself. Um, as you will see in the examples in a moment, um, the, the, the function names are also pretty descriptive, so you can follow just the function names and see what is really going on. But uh, oftentimes you, you write like 20, times, 20, 20 lines, 30 lines of setup for this to get the network to the, exactly the state that you want. Um, and oftentimes it's not really easy to, to find out what was really the intention of, 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 of all the setup. And so it really helps to put in some, some logs or um, some comments in there to describe what you're actually doing or why you're actually doing it. Um, you'll find the test class, as I mentioned, that's just going to be the name. Usually you name the class as the, the, the name of the test, and then the, you're subclassing the Bitcoin test framework, and then you do a couple of overrides, uh, depending on what you're going to need in the test. So um, the one or the two functions that you uh, are going to see override in almost every test is uh, one setting the test params by overriding set test params and then you will see run test which is then actually the implementation of the test. Um, there are other, um, other functionalities that you can override but um, you can see these for yourself in the test framework file. Um, also in every test what you're going to see is uh, calls on the nodes. Um, you will typically have an uh, array of nodes on uh, self and then you will refer to these, to these nodes by just giving the number but you can also alias them if you want um, and then you're going to do calls on them. These can either be helper calls um, but there can also be, these can also be just RPC calls. Um, RPC calls are not redefined in the, f in the function test framework, instead they are just um, thrown on over to the, actual, um, to the actual node that is running in the background. And these are going to be rec test uh, nodes, so you can use uh, rec test RPC commands like generate, for example. Um, other helpers that you will see that are very 
that you're going to use quite often is uh, weight functions, um, which are going to implement just a simple weight functionality so you don't have to worry about race conditions. Um, another thing that you're going to need frequently is uh, P2B intros introspection. So oftentimes you will have a node where you um, are um, testing something on, but uh, you want to make sure that first of all the, the network has synced up to that node, or your node has to sync up to the network, or um, just the, the block has been sent, or stuff like that. So for that there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, very often you will see sync all or sync blocks or so, which are um, basically functions that are um, uh, doing a wait for you to until everything is synced up and they're going to fail a test if they don't. Um, but you can also go deeper and subclass the P2B interface class and then um, redefine hooks on this. That they are going to be like on block, for example, um, functions which you can override and then you can um, act on these, um, on, these, uh, on these events when this node or this P2B interface actually is receiving a block. I'm just going to show you one very simple example. I really like to, um, I really like always to look at uh, get blockchain info because uh, I hope uh, many of you are running your own full node and uh, if you're running a full node the first RPC command that everyone is running is get blockchain info so that's uh, typically what people know um, and we're looking here at the test uh, file that is testing this among other RPC commands and so first um, you see up here the doc string that is uh, describing very basically what, what is actually testing a bunch of RPCs. Um, you'll see the imports. Uh, very important, we don't do any, um, any wildcard imports. Uh, we um, just uh, name every class and every uh, function that we're importing. Um, that is something that was, that was changed uh, recently um, because there are lots of, lots of functions, lots of classes in this uh, test framework and it can get kind of confusing, so um, make sure that you, that you follow this, otherwise you uh, will get yelled at by, by people if you want to contribute. Um, and then here we see the uh, name of the actual test and as I mentioned, uh, this is a subclass of Bitcoin test framework. Uh, and is overwriting the set test params uh, function. Um, here we're setting up a clean chain and uh, we need one node and um, then we go into the, into the run test which is the actual test and um, this is then calling for, for organization purposes um, several, several uh, functions that we have um, uh, refactored out here into their own functions and we're going to the get blockchain info function and um, here we see another uh, log info which is showing which, uh, which function we are at. Um, we define an array of some keys that we want to test for and then this here is actually the, the point where we are calling this RPC command and we're getting the result and then the rest of the test is basically just some asserts on, on the result of this uh, RPC call. Since we are Pretty late. I will just uh, keep going. Uh, I think you can check out all these um, all these tests for yourself. They are pretty easy to follow. I think um, I give you some more hints for that just pretty briefly. Um, one thing I talked about in my other talk anyway: debugging and logging. Um, you can use PDB uh, for um, the the Python part of the functional test for. Uh, debugging and just refer to my other talk um, for, for the rest of that functionality if you want to go into um, debugging the Bitcoin D instances. But another thing that is really helpful um, that was also mentioned yesterday is that you can um, look at all these logs in a combined function and um, you will always when your test is failing get a very helpful last line output uh, which um, is giving you a line that looks sort of like this. Um, and you can just copy paste this line and it's going to give you an aggregated log of all the logs of all the nodes of all the RPCs that you're running in the test and then you can pretty easily inspect there what has been going wrong. So that's uh, very helpful and yeah, kind of intuitive. You will just see it when, when your test fails. So um, 
I really like to give these um, these hands-on talks because I want people, uh, I want to encourage people to contribute. So uh, you don't really have any more excuses now. Um, you can go uh, maybe read these two README files. So there's the functional test README file, but there's also the general test README file that has some information that is still relevant for the functional stuff. Um, then you can look at this example test. Um, it's not really doing much. It just um, does the same or similar stuff as, as the get blockchain info test that I showed you, but it has more, it has more comments even. Um, so that's, that's maybe helpful for some people. Um, and then oftentimes I find uh, people have a hard time finding like the first to do. Um, so you can go on GitHub and uh, just uh, uh, select a label test. It's hard to read in the in the uh, link here, but um, there are um, labels for, for open issues. And um, when, I, when I did this slide, there were 39 issues with the label tests. Not all of them are going to be functional tests, but still. Um, and I can speak from experience. My first contribution was also a functional test. Um, and uh, another th way, if you don't find issues that you feel like are, are right for you, that you want to work on, you can also, in general, help improving the test coverage. So if you go at uh, Marco's website here, um, you can see very helpful statistics on um, test coverage on Bitcoin. Um, and there you can, yeah, you can basically go in here and look at, look at specific files, look at um, code paths that are maybe not, maybe not uh, tested yet. Um, oftentimes, this will be error cases, but still, these can be, these can be valuable to test. Um, and maybe you can write a test for those. So that's it for me. Any questions? So the, the test coverage will be referring to unit tests rather than function tests. Uh, no, it's actually, so there's two. I think I keep forgetting what what actually means what, but I think so. There's two outputs here, and one is just unit test. I think the first one is just unit test, and the other one is unit test and. Uh, where is uh, I think this one test Bitcoin. This is just a unit test, and the other one is um, a unit and functional test. So the second uh, statistics are going to be. Basically everything like that is not tested by any test. And you can there's also if you look in the functional test README, there is also a way to generate your own coverage uh, reports uh, with the functional test. So I actually haven't done that, uh, but that should be the output of uh, just coverage of the functional test. I have to be honest, I wasn't looking out for it at that point. It was just uh, actually an issue that I had on my Mac. It was a flaky test that is just flaky on Mac OS. And uh, I saw then that there was an issue open for about a year. Um, and then I basically um, did something that this test is, is skipped in, in certain cases. And so that just means that for all the Mac OS people that are developing on Bitcoin, they just don't see this test randomly failing. It is just an issue that is actually between Python and Mac OS. And so Bitcoin doesn't really concern itself with that stuff. So yeah, we, we really, there was no better issue than, than skip this test in this case. Um, so. If you look at the code that I've actually written for this, like it would be, everyone here is probably going to be like, I could have done this. Um, yeah, so, um, but it's just an example. And I think really, especially if, you, if you're struggling with C++ still a bit, then um, looking into functional tests is, is a, one a great way to learn about Bitcoin, but also to, to get your first contribution. Okay, thank you. Thanks.